Apparently, uh, uh, what was that? Love didn't want to like this morning, so. <laughs> we've been talking about Advent this month, and we've been going through uh, different themes of Advent um, each week. And it's, they're not necessarily, I mean, they're biblical topics, they're not themes that, that God put with Christmas, but, but they're themes that align with Christ's birth and life. They're themes that have been around for a couple hundred years that a lot of times we use at, at Christmas time to help us count down towards Christmas as we anticipate this holiday, holiday celebrating Christ's birth. Uh, we, we look at some of these themes that are represented so well uh, by Christ. We've looked at hope, we've looked at love, and today we are going to stop and we're going to look at, at peace, at this peace for all. The, the idea of this, this peace that Jesus came to the earth to bring. And in peace, we have a God of peace. We have a God who is a, a peaceful God. In fact, if you, if you open your Bible and look in the very beginning, you look in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you see this world that is a world of peace. That's how God created the world, a, a beautiful, peaceful world. He has this, this garden, and he has this, this time where, where he comes down and walks through the garden with Adam and Eve. And he has this, this time where they're in this perfect place, leading the animals, watching over this earth, taking care of it. And it's wonderful, and it's peaceful. Because we have a God of peace. We have a God who, who is a God of peace. And, and, and in fact, if you look throughout the entire Bible, there are about 400 direct references to peace in the Bible, along with a lot of other more indirect references, but over about 400 direct references to peace, because God cares about peace. And it, there are a lot of different words, and you can go back to the original language, there are a lot of different words that, that mean peace that are used in the Bible. Well, one of the, one of the best, one of my favorite, one, of the, one with the most, some of the most deep roots, perhaps, is the word shalom. We've heard that word, shalom. And shalom almost means complete. It's this idea of completeness. And in fact, if you, if you go back, they would use this term, and they would, use, they would say shalom, and it would mean may God's highest and most complete blessing be on you and all of those associated with you. And they would say shalom, and it's this idea of, of really relationship with God. This idea, it's not just a warm fuzziness that peace can sometimes seem to bring to mind. It's not just about doves out there. It's this idea of relationship with God. That's true peace. Well, that's the beginning of the Bible. If you jump to the end of the Bible, you look at the last two chapters, the first two chapters about God's original peace here on earth. You look at the last two chapters of the Bible, it's about his peace for eternity. <laughs> It's about the peace that he's going to ultimately bring, that we will have as Christians for eternity. This wonderful, glorious peace, this great relationship with God. And that's God's plan, that is his hope, that is his desire, is this wonderful peace. And that's great, and that's awesome, and that's wonderful. We go, well, there's peace in the past, there's going to be peace in the future. But what about right now? Well, that's where we get all of the Bible between those four chapters. And it's the story of God and his work to bring <coughs> peace in our lives. And it's this, this story of a God of peace and Christ's time on earth was the beginning of his work here bringing peace to us on this earth. In fact, I want to just read today Luke chapter 2. I want to read the majority of this text. We read so much of the Christmas story out of Luke at Christmas time, but how often do we actually just read kind of the majority of the story? So I'm going to read verse 4 through all the way down through verse 20 
of Luke chapter 2. It's such, a, such an amazing story. It's one that we, we don't pause and read, I, I don't think, often enough. Luke chapter 2. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and put them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You see, this is, this is the beginning of Shalom. This is the beginning of, of the return to that right relationship with God. This plan that God had all along, that sin came into the world and messed up, and that Jesus came to restore this right relationship with God. In fact, if you flip with me to the, to the book of First John, we see a description of some of some of Jesus' work here on earth. First John chapter 3, starting in verse 5. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil works to, to ruin this relationship with God. He doesn't want us to have this relationship with God, and so he works to destroy that. And the whole reason that Jesus came was to destroy his work, it was to bring us back to a place where we can have right relationship with God. That was Jesus' purpose. And it's a purpose that that in order to fulfill it, he had to, he had to give his own life. In, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5, talking about Jesus, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. You see, Jesus, he came, and he came to die for us. And he came to die to take away our sins because our sin was the cause of that separation between us and God. And when he died in our place and he took away our sins, it allows us the opportunity to have right relationship with God, to have shalom, this peace, this wonderful peace in our lives. And we can, it's so easy to see the work of sin around us, isn't it? It's so easy to look around this world and see the sinful fallen world that we live in. Destruction, 
death, suffering, misery, shame, fear, anger, hatred, racism, all of these different horrible things going on in the world, these are the results of sin. All of this separation, all of this ruining of our peace in our lives is the result of sin. Sin brings conflict. It's not a conflict in this world that has come from anything other than sin. And Christ came to bring peace. He came to bring shalom. If we look now, John the Baptist's father, when John the Baptist uh, was born, his father uh, prophesied about his role, what he would do. And as he talked about John the Baptist, he also talked about Jesus, and he talked about some of what Jesus would be able to do in our lives. Luke chapter 1, this is right before the birth story. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 76. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. He's talking about John the Baptist right now. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, which by the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And he's talking about Jesus there at the end, that Jesus will guide our feet into the path of peace. See, Jesus is a, is a guide. Not only did he come to, to destroy the sin in our lives, to offer us the ability to reach God, but he's the one who guides us in that path of peace. That, that obedience to God. That, and, and if you are someone who doesn't have peace in your life, it could possibly be, perhaps because you aren't following the path that Christ has laid out before you. If you struggle with having peace, true peace in your life, perhaps it's because you've, you've chosen a life of, of, of focusing on negativity and frustration rather than encouraging and building someone up. Maybe it's you've chosen a life of, of, of heading down a path towards making foolish decisions, foolish financial decisions, rather than, than a life of, of wise, obedient choices with what God has blessed you. Maybe, maybe you've headed down a, a life of, of, of deception and dishonesty rather than a life of honesty and openness, sincerity. And, and God has a plan for us. Jesus has a path for us. He's our guide in our path. And so often when we end up not having peace in our lives, it's because we're walking down a different path that he's guiding us towards. In fact, so often there, when there are times in our life that, that trouble comes up that we can't control, because those happen to health situations, life situations, other people's actions, when you follow Christ's path in your life, even in those times, you can have peace. You can have God's peace because it's, it's more than just this good feeling. It's deeper than that. It's a true peace from God. Ephesians, if you flip with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 13. I ask you, therefore, oh, that's chapter 3. Yeah. Ephesians 2, verse 13. Here we go. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. And it's so often, in this world, so often we think of peace as simply the lack of conflict. 
He says, as everybody just sets their weapons down and walks away. But 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 peace is more than that because you can you can stop the external conflict and still have issues boiling beneath the surface. You can still have turmoil hidden hidden still going on, even if the external signs are hidden. And true peace goes deeper than that. True peace is is peace that comes from God. It's that right relationship with Him. It's God's highest and greatest good for you and for those associated with you. Shalom, peace. True peace. Peace isn't just not fighting with another person. It's wanting shalom for that person too. It's wanting God's blessing on that person as well as yourself. That's what true peace is. Peace is relationship with God, and God wants peace for all of us. And we, we have peace. We, we know that God created this world with peace. We know that he wants peace in the future, and yet he not only came to bring peace for the future, to restore us to that, but he came to give us peace right now. We can have peace on earth right now. He is the prince of peace who came to give us peace. To give us this right relationship with God, no matter what we've done, no matter where we're at, so we can have true peace. We're called to be people who have peace in our own lives, but we're also called to be peacemakers. To help bring peace to others, to help work and, and help others as best as we can to have their relationship right with God. In this world of struggle and sin and frustration and difficulty, we can still have peace. There's a song, um, Oh Come All Ye Faithful. Holy Night. <coughs> oh Holy Night. Got my songs mixed up. Too many O songs in Christmas. I've done three O songs in <laughs> Oh Holy Night. And if you look at the words of O Holy Night, in fact, we're going to sing it here in just a minute. If you look at the words of O Holy Night, it's talking about a people bound by sin. It's talking about people who are chained by sin. And the reason that it's a holy night is because he brings freedom from that. That's why that night is so holy. That's why Jesus' birth is so precious. Is because that was when he came to this earth. That was the moment he arrived on this earth to bring about this peace. To come to a people struggling and lost and, and chained and bound and beaten and battered and to say, I bring you peace on this earth. Peace for now. Peace for eternity. He is the true Prince of Peace. Let's pray.